The singing rose up, almost a shout, the noise ringing and echoing. Agnes heard footsteps in the main stairs out in the hall. The master was surely coming, and she should be about her business. But she could not take her eyes from the singing figure, nor could she seem to stop herself from continuing with the song. She's taken out her little penknife, fine flowers in the valley, and twine the sweet babe o' its life, and the green leaves they grow rarely. Red, bloody red, blossomed in the gray vapors as the wraith's right hand plunged into the swaddling, and steel glinted in the thin morning sunlight. No! Agnes shouted and stepped forward. She had no plan other than to stop what she perceived to be an attack on the babe. She put out a hand, reaching into the ghostly vapor. It felt like she had plunged her fingers into ice, a cold that gripped her in the wrist, arm, into her chest, where it seemed to stop her heart, stop time itself. A great darkness welled up inside her, and she fell into it. The last thing she heard was the song, in a high girlish voice, singing in little more than a whisper. If you smile so sweet, you'll smile me dead, and the green leaves, they grow rarely. She woke to full sun in her face and a soft cushion at her cheek. It took her several seconds to note that she was not, in fact, in her bed, but rather sitting upright in one of the fine chairs in the front parlor. Worse still, the fact that it was full daylight meant that she was seriously behind in her duties and would be in line for the severest scolding in her return downstairs. She sat up with a start, only to be pushed back by a firm hand. The master himself stood over her. You're not going anywhere, lass. Stay where you are. You've had a bit of a turn. Agnes's whole left arm felt like a slab of cold stone, and the memory flooded back of reaching into the wraith, and of the song following her down into the black. You heard her, didn't you? The master said, and when Agnes looked into his eyes, she was shocked to see fresh tears swelling there. She sang for you. Agnes nodded, almost afraid to speak, for it was not her place. This was not her place. An increasing panic was growing in her the longer she was made to stay in the chair, and finally she found her voice. I beg your pardon, sir, she said in what her mother would have called her Sunday voice. I did not intend to disturb you in any manner. If you would excuse me, I shall be on my way. She expected to be allowed to depart forthwith for the master's reputation was of a man who so valued his privacy that few, apart from his manservant and the butler, caught sight of him from day to day. So she was surprised when the gruff man leaning over her spoke softly, with a sad smile on his face that made him look less stern. For the first time she noted that the master was considerably younger than she had thought certainly far younger than her own father, and perhaps not that much older than her own older brother. And his smile did much to quell her panic. When he pressed her back into the chair again, she did not resist, and indeed it was infinitely more preferred to brushing out grates and stoking fires. Tell me, he said softly, of what did she sing? I have heard tell of the singing, but not of the song. 